the voice in the night. So Cora's sleeping, really beautiful lighting here too, and the Oh my god! <laughs> so yeah, Cora's been having some nightmares. It was quite the way to start an episode too. Just like, oh, it's happening? It's happening already? Hold on, I haven't buckled in yet! More importantly though, we're diving headfirst into establishing Cora's fear of Amon. One of the most interesting aspects of this dynamic is the fact that Cora is legitimately terrified of Amon and his bending stealing abilities. Aang never really seemed too afraid of Ozai, more just uncertain of himself or his actions, so having an avatar who is actually so afraid of their main bad guy is a super unique twist, especially for Korra. Korra has been a bold, fearless badass so far in the show. Nothing's really phased her. So to know she does have this nagging fear inside of her really helps to humanize her, on top of giving her a super interesting arc for this season. And I also love how this fear didn't just pop in out of nowhere. When the chi blockers first blocked her bending, you can actually hear just how unsettled she was about it. Mm. Oh, I can't bend! I can't bend! Then later at Amon's speech, her fear is practically written all over her face. What a good emotional support, girl! Ah, finally, we get introduced to the Republic City Council. Of course, there's Tenzin, then there's Tarlock, and then there's that old lady and that old dude, and then the bald guy. So yeah, I understand not bothering to fully flesh out the admittedly unimportant council members, but at the very least, I wish they weren't all just boring old geezers. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit of something I could see as a personality. Honestly, I'm surprised it took this long to introduce Tarlock to the story. He plays a major role in this season, and it's surprising how paced out the important character introductions have been. In a good way. I think the pacing for season one of Korra is really spot on. Before we move on, here's a little bit of background world building. Despite having five people on the council, you'd expect one of them to represent non-benders, but no. Everyone on the council is a bender, which only further pushes the idea of non-benders being pushed down in society. There's no one on this council who would really understand a non-benders' point of view when it comes to Amon. Now, if you're wondering why are there five when there's only four nations, it's because there's two for the water tribes, one from the North Pole and one from the South Pole, apparently. This hints at the fact that there's actually some big tension between the two tribes, but that won't really get touched on until season two. It's really cool seeing it established this early on, though. This is just another one of your ploys to gain more power isn't it? Taking heavy-handed exposition lessons from your mom there, Tenzin? Just like with episode one, this line feels way too forced and super unnecessary. Everything about Tarlock's demeanor and dialogue in this scene already displayed his ambitious nature and his skills in manipulation. All this comment does is sets up that Tenzin doesn't really like Tarlock, but it more comes across that Tenzin is just being an asshole here. This is oddly rude and confrontational, even for him. Republic City was threatened by another dangerous man, Yakone. Your father wasn't afraid to deal with him head on. And how dare you compare yourself to Avatar Aang? See, this line feels a lot more in character and is way less heavy handed. Despite the fact it's also giving us some important exposition here, too. Korra just really flops between fantastic dialogue and clunky exposition sometimes. <laughs> Oh, then <laughs> slick my ass. After a bit more spooky, scary establishment for Korra, we cut to Mako, wandering into traffic, because he's just too cool to look both ways before crossing the street. Don't be like Mako. Always look both ways. Coming crashing into the scene is our last major character introduction for season one, Asami. Oh, wow, so pretty, and clearly Mako thinks so too. While apologizing, Asami recognizes him as a pro bender and quickly sets up a date between them. Good job, Mako, you bumbled your way into a hot date. What's that? Her green goggles and dark outfit feel awfully reminiscent of the Equalist's masks? Eh, don't worry about it, she's hot. Just focus on the fact that she She's hot. <laughs> 
Airbenders never turn away a hungry guest, am I right? I'm gonna puke on you. Tarlock's here to butter up Korra and asks her to join his newly established task force to go out and fight the Equalists. However, she turns him down. She uses her avatar training as an excuse, but, well, it's not hard to realize there's something else on her mind, too. Why do you have three ponytails? And how come you smell like a lady? You're weird. I'm a savage. Yeah. While on their date, Mako mentions how the Fire Ferrets probably won't be able to keep participating in the tournament. Tell me, what's the problem? Alright, 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 just you wait there, missy. Asami being forward enough to set them up on the date almost seven seconds after meeting Mako was understandable. She clearly thought he was cute, and recognizes the fact that he has at least some fame. You gotta shoot your shot when you get the chance, right? But she is being awfully chummy with Mako here. These two barely know each other, yet she's holding his hand and is speaking to him like they're old friends. It comes across as more manipulative rather than endearing. So Mako reveals that he's too poor to keep participating in the Probender tournament, but lucky for him, Asami's filthy stinking rich. She introduces him to her dad, the man who invented Korra's version of cars, or Sato-mobiles. His last name is Sato. He's willing to back up the fire ferrets and help pay their fees, so it looks like the tournament is back on. Bo Lin, there you are. Jeez, I've been waiting for you to show up all episode. <laughs> Missed you at practice this week. Okay, I'll bring it up as we keep going, but Korra is the biggest practice ditcher in the world. This will keep being brought up, and I will point it out every single time. Let's make a Korra misses practice counter. I honestly do love this scene though. I bet a lot of people overlook it. Bolin so casually brings up the fact that he is also afraid of Amon and has also been having nightmares, just like Korra. Yet Korra has been going to great lengths to ignore it, to dismiss the topic, keep her fears a secret. Who's this Tarlock guy? Is he bothering you? Huh? Cause I could have a word with him. I'm a savage. I'm just really focused on my airbending right now, is all. So that was a fucking lie. Really cool of Tenzin that he realizes what Korra's problem is, but also realizes not to push her on it. He doesn't try to force Korra to talk about her fear. He knows to give her the time to be ready to tell him herself. When you're already wrestling with fears, having someone trying to confront you on it, even if it's out of good intentions, can make you feel like you're being backed into a corner. And that definitely won't help anyone in this sort of situation. Ladies and gentlemen, Gentlemen, this is one of the coolest uses of earthbending ever. <laughs> Tarlock is throwing a gala in your honor. Isn't it pronounced gala? Like, did my little pony lie to me? <laughs> so, the gala doesn't turn out as great as you might think. Tarlock basically uses it to corner Korra in front of the press and pressures her into agreeing into joining his task force. Shout out to Tarlock's task force. Him, Korra, and an army of dudes who all look exactly the same as each other. <laughs> Admittedly, working with the task force goes a lot better than expected, and Tarlock even starts to seem like a bit of a better guy than he initially let on. No core for practice again? Doesn't look like it. Things must have been going a lot better than Korra expected because she very suddenly challenges Amon to a one-on-one -on -one duel. Did Korra's fears suddenly clear up? Hmm, hmm. Oh, but let's ignore that cool and interesting plot point for a second to go back to Mako and Asami. This scarf was my father's and it's all I have left of him. Okay, all right, keep, keep this in mind. It won't be until I'm like in the middle of season three, but it'll come back up. This is important. <laughs> Look at this fucking smooth ass dismount from Tenzin. That was immaculate. <laughs> so Korra goes to the dual site against both Tenzin and Tarlock's wishes. If anything goes wrong, I have a fleet of police airships ready to swoop down. After waiting a while, it doesn't seem like Amon's going to answer her call. Until... <laughs> The use of Korra's fire to briefly illuminate the scene is so good. It gives the whole scene an awfully menacing vibe, adding to that concept of fear. Which gets explored further in the next scene, when the lighting casts such hard shadows, limiting the light enough to be creepy, but not making everything so dark that it's hard to see. It looks like Korra's worst nightmares have come true, as Amon now stands before her, but to her surprise, he doesn't take her bending away. You'd only become a martyr. And there's of every nation would rally behind your untimely demise. I'm sure some people might feel like this is a bit of a cop-out, but I actually really like it. Amon has essentially proven to Korra that 
he can win very easily. In a matter of minutes, he has her before him and he could take her bending away whenever he wanted to. He's incredibly calculated and he's flaunting it here. And then the coolest shit starts happening. These brief glimpses at something else, something from when Aang was an adult, were so intriguing. What does it mean? Why is she seeing this now? And the real cherry on top is Korra mistaking Tenzin for Aang. Like I said in episode 1, both Tenzin and Korra have big shoes to fill when it comes to living up to what Aang accomplished. This scene is the biggest heart-to-heart -heart these characters have had yet, pushing their relationship into a positive direction together. And it's a really good emotional scene scene too. Korra opening up about her fears, while maybe a bit predictable for this episode, still delivers that gut punch it needed to. Because no one wants to admit to their fears, especially when they're supposed to be brave for others, someone in a position of power like the Avatar. But also, Korra's human. Korra can still make mistakes, and Korra is still just a kid. She's only like 17, and it makes a lot of sense she would be afraid of the man who can take her bending away. Her bending is her favorite thing. She's been doing it all her life, and she's trained extensively to be the best at it as she can be. Of course she's afraid. But the expectation that the media pushes onto her that being afraid is some sort of bad thing is disgusting. Worse is the fact that this happens in real life too. Seeing Korra opening up to Tenzin feels like there's a weight being lifted. It takes real bravery to admit your fears. That's something even grown adults need to hear from time to time. And that's how the episode ends. No cutesy, funny scene afterwards to lift your spirits back up. Nothing to give you or Korra any newfound hope. She just cries in Tenzin's arms as he comforts her. My overall thoughts for this episode is, once again, I love it. It's the first episode where we spend a lot of time with Korra and the brothers, but they almost never interact. Korra meets them at the gala and she says Mako told me so much about you really because he hasn't mentioned you at all and it's like yeah because you haven't seen them you're the one missing practice maybe Mako could have told you about Asami if you ever bothered to show up also while some might think the message for this episode is heavy-handed and easy to see coming I still think it's masterfully executed also we get a lot of interesting character developments at this point in time I was really unsure whether or not I could trust Tarlock or Asami Asami's weirdly forward attitude while insisting on being close with Mako and her suspicious colored helmet gave me some big red flags. But she also does seem genuinely nice, helping the fire ferrets pay off their Annie for the tournament. Alternatively, Tarlock is presented as an asshole that Tenzin doesn't like, who tries to bribe Korra into joining his task force just to manipulate her into agreeing to it after his prior attempts failed. But also, he was right there to protect Korra during the fight on the Equalists, and he even tried to convince her not to fight Amon alone. Both are hard to get a full read on, and it just adds to the fun intrigue of the show. While the action was brief, it was also thrilling, but I think it's important this episode prioritizes its emotional punches over its physical ones. Korra's development here is some of the best characterization we've seen for her, and it's fantastic seeing her and Tenzin continue to grow together. This is really a great episode, and I'm going to bask in how well executed it is, because next time... Well, next time we're going to get our first real big misstep for The Legend of Korra. I hope I'll see you there. <laughs> Gala. You remember one time I liked you? No. Good, cause never happened. Oh. Aha! Oh. Amon, I challenge you to a duel. It's time to do 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 Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Shout out to my ten dollar patrons. You're all amazing. Nako, James Dodds, Cool Duck, Andrew, Ramiel, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, G Extreme, Classy Critic, Morgid Pendragon. Boulder Off Bros, Sunny Shy, Great Bar, Caleb Grimm, Pentamenta, Genital War Thunder, Jake, Storm, Amber, Lolith, Livid Ares, Hype Man, Luno the Evoker, Zero to Hero, and Keithan. 
So yeah, I hope you liked this video. Uh, tell me what you think about the concept of fear and fear being portrayed by people who are supposed to be in positions of power. It's a really interesting concept and I think this episode tackled it pretty well. So any thoughts and opinions about this episode and anything else about The Legend of Korra, anything you want to say, leave them in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.